So good morning, everyone. My name is Julie Baker. I'm the Executive Director of Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. Welcome you, you to the Orange County Regional Conversation. Um, we're just waiting for a handful more people to come in to the room, as it were, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So welcome and get your cup of coffee and let's get ready to have a wonderful conversation about where we can go with the arts and culture sector right now um, in the midst of uh, the public health crisis and we can focus on what we what we can do not what we can't do at this moment in time so excited to have a conversation with you all thank you for being here Rick, do you want to go ahead and get us started here? Looks like maybe. Happy we to do so. Okay, so uh, thank you, Julie, and uh, welcome everybody. I think I know many of you. Rick Stein, I'm the president and CEO of Arts Orange County. And uh, with me as co-host today is Edmund Velasco, who is president of the Orange County Musicians Union, uh, the local seven of the American Federation of Musicians. And uh, it's a pleasure for us to be hosting this conversation. And we're actually going to start right off. We've, we've uh, uh, got the pleasure of uh, one of our uh, arts champions in Sacramento, an elected official, Assemblywoman Sharon Quirk Silva. And uh, she's been a great uh, supporter of the arts uh, since she's been in Sacramento and even before that in the city of Fullerton, uh, where she was mayor. And um, we had uh, invited her to say a few words about uh, the landscape up there, but we also uh, shared with her a couple of key concerns of the arts community to see if uh, she might include those in her remarks. So uh, uh, Sharon, Assemblywoman Silva, Quirk Silva, please uh, take the floor. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's definitely an honor to be here with all the uh, wonderful creative minds that we need. And I really do think in times of uh, hardship and difficulty, uh, one of the things that people go back to is what soothes them, what uh, relaxes them, what makes them joyful. And arts for many people is that special place. So whether it's with music or uh, with uh, dance or uh, painting, whatever it is. I know for myself, I've kind of gone back to some of the things that I've really enjoyed uh, in the past, but haven't had time for. Uh, but uh, just a, a very quick update. I have been a classroom teacher for 30 years and uh, saw many, many attempts over those decades to bring arts into the classrooms. Fullerton is I'm very committed to that as we have all the arts for all the kids, which has been led by Laura Lynn Eschner, where uh, each classroom gets six weeks of art lessons in a different, um, uh, whether it be theater or dance. But the most important thing is that there's been an effort to bring that to classrooms and not get rid of it in a downturn. So my message to you is uh, that uh, it is difficult right now, especially with a budget def deficit. It's also difficult uh, when uh, other things for people uh, are very uh, hard to manage. But uh, you can count on me from North Orange County to do what I can to support uh, the arts. We are very proud to have brought down two and a half million dollars from the state uh, so that uh, Rick Stein and partners can work in Fullerton to build a dream of not only a art uh, slash literacy, I don't even want to say center because it's going to be more than that. It's going to be an experience. 
And uh, we are hoping to continue to partner uh, with others in Orange County that may have interests. And it's all about navigating, asking, and pushing. So with that, uh, thank you for everything you do because to me, arts are really what life is about. It's all the good stuff. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman, <clears throat> and uh, for being with us today. And uh, uh, the project that uh, you were referring to is the historic Hunt Library, uh, which was built in 1962 and sits on three acres in Fullerton. And it's uh, about to embark on a renovation thanks to um, a state grant that uh, you brought down to Fullerton and uh, a number of organizations are partnering on uh, the programmatic development and planning for that, including Arts Orange County and uh, Heritage Future. Thank you for that opportunity. It's great to work with you. Please stay in touch. I have to jump off. I'm doing the Zoom, 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 but uh, thank you for everything. Bye-bye. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. So, um, we will be joined by another elected official in a few minutes. Um, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump in with just a few um, updates uh, as part of my presentation. Um, so I think uh, the concerns that so many of us have in terms of surviving in these times and uh, pivoting and uh, keeping people employed as best we can uh, in pursuit of our missions uh, have led us to seek uh, what resources are available out there. And the CARES Act provided a number of these, <clears throat> but how it uh, uh, made its way down to localities uh, made it very complicated in many instances for uh, nonprofit arts organizations to be able to access those funds. And so we, over the past three or four months at Arts Orange County, have vigorously and aggressively uh, lobbied and advocated with uh, the County Board of Supervisors and with individual cities, mayors and councils uh, on the distribution of CARES Act funds that are at their disposal. Uh, there were five organizations in Orange County that received the $50,000 National Endowment for the Arts CARES Act grants. And there's a very small amount, probably about 12 to 15,000 of uh, NEA CARES Act money that will come through California Arts Council to us to regrant to tiny uh, organizations uh, that are uh, serving communities of color. But in between that, we've started at Arts Orange County a private fund, a relief fund, and raised over 150,000. And we were successful in getting District 3 Supervisor Don Wagner uh, to make $500,000 available for uh, arts organizations and arts related businesses in his district. Those funds were awarded and distributed this past week. Uh, we have another municipality we will be announcing soon. It's in the contracting phase that will be making $500,000 available for their artists and arts organizations. And then uh, three of our supervisor districts, one, four, and five, also allowed nonprofits to apply for their small business grants. And we pushed very hard on that. And so far, approximately $250,000 has already been awarded to uh, arts nonprofits in Orange County as a result of that. And there are still more grants being announced. So we think it'll probably be about 300,000. All told, uh, we believe that we will hit about $2 million in relief funds from all of our sources, primarily public funding through the CARES Act, but including uh, individual giving as well. Um, just looking to see if uh, Assemblywoman Cody Petrie Norris has joined us yet. It does not look like she has. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce uh, um, uh, Edmund Velasco uh, to say a few words of introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Edmund Velasco. I'm the uh, newly installed president of Local 7, uh, Musicians Local 7 in Orange County. Um, I wanted to say just a couple of things about uh, uh, things that pieces of legislation that we're following and, and trying to promote. One is uh, the 2257 emergency uh, uh, bill uh, introduced by Gonzalez. It was 
it's there's still an 1850 bill, which is the AB5 um, uh, supplemental bill, which defines a lot more about who exactly is exempt from the dynamics uh, decision, as opposed to who is still under the Borello. So there's, this, um, it still hasn't passed, but they think that they have the votes um, to be able to pass the 2257, which is the emergency bill, which is the same as 1850. And it lists all the exemptions, including musicians, artists, photographers, freelance writers. Um, it's very comprehensive. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I really strongly suggest that you, um, you take a look at it, uh, the legislative, slide, legislative site. Um, the other thing that we're working on is to try to push for um, the new, newly introduced Mixed Earners Act um, by um, Adam Schiff and, uh, and, uh, and Representative Chu in, in the federal course because this would allow, one of the big gaps that we had in the, in the CARES Act is that if you applied for unemployment, if you had any W-2 work, you were not allowed to take any um, pandemic unemployment assistance. So if you had just a, like a couple of thousand dollars of, of W-2 work, it wouldn't, you would not qualify for, um, for any kind of pandemic unemployment assistance. But you wouldn't really qualify for that much for unemployment. So, I mean, if, for people who are like professional musicians or actors or anybody in the arts field, we don't make our living strictly from one source. We make it usually from either w, uh, from both W-2 work and 1099 work. So this made it almost impossible for people to actually replace the income through unemployment insurance to be able to survive. And one of the things that um, I know as, as presenters and um, believe me, I, I understand that you guys have, you know, I know that a lot of you work really hard to make sure that you're, the people that you employ are able to survive. But one of the things that has been the issue for us is that there's not enough, we can't, we can't qualify with just one source of income. We have to actually qualify for two sources of income. And that's something that was not addressed in the original CARES Act. Uh, this act would actually be an amendment to the CARES Act and would be um, uh, retroactive. So the people who have not had a chance to get collect unemployment will actually be able to collect unemployment so that they'll be able to survive these times and be able to um, be available for you to be able to put on your concerts or your um, gallery uh, showings. You know, all, all the different parts of the arts um, uh, conversation that we're talking about, the artists are the ones who create it, it'd be great if the unemployment insurance actually reflected all the different ways that we contribute to society, either through independent contracting work or as employees. And we are working really hard to, to be able to do that. And we are working hard to try to pass um, the extension of the $600 so that even if you're getting $100 in unemployment through, the, um, uh, through regular unemployment, at least the artist will be able to qualify for something that's actually closer to a living wage. Most of the time it's not, but if it's close, we'll make it work. And I do have to, I do have to applaud you know, some of the employers that we have here that they have done everything they can to keep musicians employed, even though they can't present live concerts. But we, uh, we do really appreciate you know, the, the creativeness that they've been able to um, uh, show through um, streaming uh, agreements and um, uh, remote uh, or limited access uh, live engagements. So thank you very much. And I, I look forward to working with all of you um, sooner or later and be able to create some great wor uh, works of art together. Great. And uh, Julie Baker is next on our agenda to speak from Californians for the Arts. And uh, just so you know, Edmund and I are both board members of Californians for the Arts. Yes. Thank you, Rick. Thank Edmund. Thank you, Edmund. Um, I 
did want to just mention why we're doing these regional conversations. These have been tapped to, um, we've got 25 board members across the state of California. Um, being a, an advocacy, statewide advocacy organization for the state of California can have its challenges in that we are 40 million people, a size of a small country. We ourselves are a um, small nonprofit arts organization. Our budget is less than 250,000. We have one staff, full-time staff person, myself, and Jade Alicia, who's over here also, is our part-time staff person. So our board members are really critical to the success of our organization. And then the regionals are, um, we divided into nine regions, and it's really critical for us to hear from you so we can be effective and informed advocates on your behalf, both at the state and federal level. I am the captain for Americans for the Arts. Peter Gordon is here, um, who uh, is from Americans for the Arts, and uh, he'll be speaking quick, uh, shortly as well. So I want to give you a quick update on what Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates has been working on. And uh, we've been Immediately in March, as soon as we saw that uh, COVID was coming in, we worked to protect the California Arts Council's budget. That's the state arts agency. I'm assuming many of you received those funds. It's 20, about 26 million in ongoing funds. We are pleased to report that in early July, the budget was signed. That was protected. We've worked for years to build that budget. We do not want to see it go backwards. <laughs> We've, uh, it's, it was at about a million dollars for 10 years. So this is important to keep, keep in mind. We also made it clear to lawmakers that we want to see relief funds happening. If there's going to be relief funds, we want to see them brought to the arts and culture sector working hard to educate them on the impact of what is happening there using some of the data, um, excellent data from Americans for the Arts, as well as a survey that we will be producing shortly in August. Um, so we hope that you will complete that so we can really have strong data. Um, we were also been advocating to the Arts Council on getting um, grants out quickly to fund artists as well. And we were really pleased that they put aside um, about $900,000 in $1,000 grants for artists that is now being um, distributed through the Center for Cultural Innovation. We are also working on a private match to that because one of the things that we know is that there is no statewide funds for the arts except for the California Arts Council at this moment in time. Every arts uh, delivery program for funding right now is very regional. We're also working on jobs creation for the creative sector. We've had a victory recently. Uh, the governor put together a jobs and economic reco recovery task force. When he first started it, there were no more, there were no people from arts and culture on it. Um, through collective advocacy, we were able to get Deborah Cullinan, who is the uh, CEO of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco on the uh, task force. She has been working um, with us as well, and we're working on a statewide now um, uh, convening for arts and culture with the help of the governor's task force to address not only what is the impact, but what are we doing right now to sustain our businesses in addition to provide the public health and mental health services that the arts do. One of the things that we know is that everyone is looking to the arts, as, as the Assemblywoman said earlier, for soothing, for health, for, for wellness, for overall wellness. And one of the things that we know also is the arts do this, but we're not always compensated for it. We don't, we look to the arts for this, but we don't always make the correlation that arts are essential, arts are valued, arts need to be invested in. And artists are essential workers. Artists are workers and we should be looked to as part of the solution during a public health crisis. There's a lot that we can be doing that we're already doing. We want to make sure that those investments are made. We also know that 68 percent of, um, of artists and uh, are unemployed at the moment and the numbers are probably rising daily and without that $600 we know that a lot of these artists are going to be not only unemployed, but we're gonna have issues with shelter and food and safety and health um, and health care. So what can we do about that? We need to create jobs for the creative sector while we're in this crisis. And that's something we're absolutely working on with the governor's office, with legislators, um, with our lobbyists. And we work on that at both the state and federal level. Um, we've been working also, there's a $100 billion economic stimulus package that um, the legislator just started to explore. We're working with 
with Cal nonprofits and others to make sure that nonprofits are included in that language as your excellent guide here in, Arts, um, in Orange County, Rick Stein has been doing. And then finally, I just wanted to mention some of the stuff that we're doing in terms of public will and messaging, because that's really important is how do we shift the public's uh, attention to understanding the value that artists and arts and culture organizations are bringing to their communities. And so we tagged on to artists are second responders as part of our messaging. And again, it's that correlation to essential nature of arts and arts and culture in your own communities in the state, both economically, as well as into our personal lives, our mental health and our wellness, and all the other areas of social uh, change that we make in our communities, whether it's addressing homelessness, preventing kids growing into um, incarceration, is re-entry after incarceration, all the different things that arts and culture are doing in terms of engagement. We want to see that recognized, invested in, and uh, arts integrated rather than separated. So just wanted to give you a quick overview of the number of things that we're working on. But today we also want to be here to listen. And I see that the assembly member uh, uh, has joined us. So we want to welcome her, Rick. I'm sorry to, to take up yes. your space there. Uh, perfect timing, Julie. So yes, uh, uh, it's a delight to welcome one of our great arts champions in Sacramento, hailing from Laguna Beach, Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris. And a year ago, Assemblywoman Petrie Norris spoke at our Arts Day in Sacramento. and. Uh, uh, we can't be there uh, physically today, but uh, we're glad you can join us on this call. Welcome. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. So good to see you and see everybody on the line. We've all gotten we've all gotten pretty good about uh, our virtual virtual Zoom gatherings. Not as good as in person, but uh, but it's good to see you nonetheless. Um, so. I am, for the, those of you who don't know me, I am Assemblymember Cotty Petrie Norris, and I represent the 74th Assembly District, which includes Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, Huntington Beach, Irvine, Costa Mesa, and Laguna Woods. Um, as, uh, as all of, as like so many of you, my focus over the course of the last several months has been very much COVID-19 response and recovery. COVID, as you know, is an unprecedented crisis. And uh, while we know that our statewide stay at home orders have saved lives, we also know that it has been absolutely devastating for workers, for Julie, as you said, artists who are workers, for families, for small businesses, for nonprofits all across our state. And um, I think a couple of things in the midst of this pandemic, it has been inspiring and uplifting to see the way in which uh, artists and arts organizations are continuing to bring creativity and inspiration to our communities um, and continuing to uplift our communities in this moment of, of, unprecedented, of unprecedented crisis. And I also want to just commend the leaders at Arts OC. You've been doing a really incredible job at supporting the arts and uh, at supporting artists and arts organizations during these incredibly tough times. Um, you, your efforts to raise, I think you, you were able to raise a resilience fund of $150,000, which will have a, a huge impact uh, here in Orange County. Though so, um, I, like you, recognize that that very much is the tip of the iceberg. And as we set both our state and, uh, and the country on a path to recovery as we navigate this crisis, it is, as, as Julie, you said, important to ensure that our that all of our nonprofits, including our, our arts organizations, are part of that uh, dynamic recovery conversation. Um, I just want to quickly touch on because I know it was something I think you all are, are talking about, or that you had some questions on. Um, you know, before before we move on, I want to quickly touch on AB five. Um, so I. I know that AB5 had a number of unintended consequences for artists and uh, for the arts community. And since the passage of AB5, I have met with many, many independent artists and advocates who have been, been very adversely impacted by AB5's limitations on freelance work um, and on freelance workers. So I was, I was happy to support during this session and we'll continue to support uh, AB 1850 and AB 2257, which makes some fixes and has made some progress. And um, I just want, you know, everyone on the call to know that, that 
you know, my door is very open to ongoing conversations uh, and ensuring that if there's additional work that's required uh, and additional flexibility that's th that we need to talk about for uh, for your community, um, very open to have those those conversations and and that dialogue. Um, I think, you know, just in closing, um, there's there's a quote that I'm not sure. I was actually I just looked it up online, and I'm not even sure if it's a real quote, but it's become kind of an urban legend. But it, as I'm sure you know, when uh, we were in the midst of World War II. Uh, Winston Churchill was asked to cut arts funding in order to support the war effort. And his famous or perhaps infamous uh, response was, then what are we fighting for? And I think it's particularly in these moments of, um, of, of great sorrow for our nation of incredible heartbreak that, um, that arts and the work that so many of you do uh, reinvigorate and reinforce our belief in in our own humanity um, and that is why in my view it is incredibly vital for us to to work on alongside you to support your organizations and artists particularly in this moment thank you so much assemblywoman petrie norris it's it's just uh, uh wonderful to have a supporter like you in the capitol and we will keep in touch and share with you the stories from our community uh, uh, that uh, will help you in your work. Well, thank you. All right, pleasure to be able to join you all today. Thanks for everything you're doing and uh, I uh, hope you have a very productive rest of your uh, rest of the Zoom conference. Thank you. All right, be well. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Julie, would you like to introduce uh, our next speaker? Oh, it'd be my pleasure. I am introducing our lobbyist. I'm now wearing our, my hat as the executive director of California Arts Advocates, not Californians for the arts. And Jason Schmelzer has been our lobbyist for many years now. Um, he has been integral to making sure that the funding for the California Arts Council has increased. And when we're also talking about bills like Assembly Bill 5, um, you know, the exemption for fine artists is in there due to the work of California arts advocates and uh, to the excellent lobbying and uh, advice that we receive from a gentleman named Jason Schmelzer. So Jason's going to give us an overview of kind of what's happening right now in Sacramento. As, as everything has changed, things have changed also there. So Jason, tell us, tell us what the report, although you've got, I think, Desolation Wilderness behind you that's not Sacramento. I do. I do. If you, uh, with everything the way it is, I've been finding a lot of joy being up in the mountains with virtually nobody <laughs> other than my family. Uh, thank you. I'll try to weave together, I think, the various things that you've heard um, uh, from the various speakers today. There's been a little bit of a touch on Sacramento. And yes, Julie, it's been a while since I've been lobbying for you. I think when I started, I didn't have any gray in my beard. Um, so that's, that's how long. See what you've done to me? <laughs> no. Um, but you're right, uh, things have changed in Sacramento. I, I first wanna go back to the January baseline because it's really easy this year to forget where you were six months ago, eight months ago, right? Uh, Cause it's been so crazy. But listen, when we started the year, we were already facing some troubles. Um, you know, AB5 for all of its benefits. And, you know, uh, I think the arts community is a kind of a special business category because I think the folks in the arts community typically agree with concepts ar around labor protection and valuing human labor and, and, and those types of things. Um, so I think you know, the arts community is very supportive of, of getting things right with, with uh, workers and employers, but AB5 was a big sea change and it caused uh, a lot of disruption in the industry and there's a realignment. So that was a big deal and we continue to kind of work through some of the issues surrounding that. So that was pre-COVID, right? Um, and also pre-COVID, you know, the state was really just starting to do their part. Um, you know, respectfully to, to the state. Uh, with respect to the arts, California has always been really low uh, compared to other states in terms of arts funding and, and California arts advocates had been doing some great work over the past few years uh, to get us up from one, 1 million to 25 million. And so we were just starting, I feel like, to get um, ahead of things. Uh, enter COVID, uh, which is probably worse for you uh, than anybody else uh, in terms of like, your industry. Uh, you were one of the first folks shut down. Uh, I have concert tickets hanging from my lamp right here uh, that I have that haven't been used. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, you know, nothing happening uh, in some areas. Uh, and then you're going to be the last to open. 
So in terms of California, you know, the, it, there is a, a, a response for the state. There is something that the state should be doing. The federal government has come through with a lot of, a lot of stuff. So there's really good news here. Um, and I, I think primarily uh, what, what I'd want to focus on is your ability to impact your own future, right? Because that's what really matters. Um, and uh, I keep saying this, the good news for everybody is that people like me are less consequential right now. Um, you know, suit wearing lobbyist guys uh, don't have as much pull as we normally do. But that's actually pretty good um, from just a human being perspective. That means that a lot of people in the districts um, have better access to legislators. You as artists um, and as um, you know, uh, arts organizations have the ability to really reach out and establish those relationships as Rick has demonstrated uh, with a couple of assembly members on the phone. So if I have any advice for you right now, it's really to lean into those local relationships. They're very important. I mean, in times like this, uh, where the system is disrupted and we've got a hard time doing the normal things, this is really a time for normal everyday people to shine uh, in the district and establish those relationships and echo um, some of the themes, you know, that we're talking about um, with respect to arts uh, on, on um, a grand scale and, and as it and relates with government. So uh, one other issue I'd raise is the budget. Um, you know, California was doing pretty darn good uh, relative to our fiscal condition. We had a huge reserve that was put into place by the legislature and Jerry Brown. Um, we we, we uh, had good tax revenues. Obviously, COVID has changed that. Um, you all know this, but on the local level and the state level, tax receipts are down significantly. Uh, this year, as Julie indicated, we did not see a cut to the California Arts Council. Um, uh, I can tell you the legislature doesn't want to dip much more into the reserve uh, that they've got, um, uh, which is, you know, good budgeting, but hard in, in terms of other things. Uh, there might be some stimulus coming from the federal government. Who knows uh, when, it, when it comes to the federal government these days. Um, but I would just put everybody uh, on watch out. Um, we're going to be on the defensive next year. We're going to need to watch that funding. I mean, we're going to need to protect it. Um, so with that, I'll hand back to, to Julie and Rick. Uh, and thanks for having me. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it is definitely something we need to keep an eye on. And so if you're not a, uh, on our email list and get our action alerts, we ask that you would uh, do that. And Jada Liss will put that in um, the chat box there, because that way, when we do have action alerts to make sure that you're notifying and Rick, of course, is letting you know as well, it is important that we do hear from all the voices across California and let your legislators know how critical um, the funding support from California Arts Council is, as well as the funding that you get from the federal government. PPP loans have been dramatically um, impactful for the arts sector. Americans for the Arts has reported, I think, that uh, there was, um, how, what was it, 4.9 million PPP loans um, and Oh, anyway, I'm going to let Peter talk about it. I have it in my writing, but then I was like, wait, I'm confused. So I'm going to give it to Peter. So Peter is here from Americans for the Arts. Um, who, and again, they do federal advocacy for the arts. They've been doing this for a very long time. They're doing it in very strange and unprecedented times. I said, I think, if Peter, it's 1034 here on the West Coast. I'm imagining that by 11 a.m. things are going to be different than the conversation we're having right now because things are changing so quickly in, in Washington. But Peter, um, please introduce yourself. And, and share with us um, what you're seeing in the next five minutes, if you could, in um, federal advocacy for the arts, and then we'll get into a conversation with everyone here today. Definitely. Thanks, Jillian. Um, hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. And I apologize if you can also hear some screaming. It's, uh, nap time isn't going so smoothly for <laughs> a uh, soon-to-be three-year-old tomorrow, so apologize in advance for that. Um, Peter Gordon, I'm with uh, Director of Federal Affairs for Americans for the Arts been with uh, Americans for the Arts for about a year and a half now. Um, I originally started uh, my Washington career uh, on Capitol Hill working, worked both in the House and the Senate side for leaving to Hill, the Hill to do some various nonprofit stuff before ending up with Americans for the Arts. Um, but uh, like Julie mentioned and some others uh, earlier, I mean, the big thing that happened obviously this year was the CARES Act. Um, $2.3 trillion in funding. Um, I think it's been scored since then, larger than that. But just to give it some perspective, um, for FY 2020, the uh, funding for the federal government for all of um, September through uh, this, uh, October through this September um, was $1.7 trillion. So crazy unprecedented 
unprecedented amount of spending. And obviously we still need lots more as you guys can all attest to. Um, so uh, for this next bill, the three major things that we are looking at are um, an extension of the PBP program. Um, as Julius mentioned earlier regarding some numbers around that, um, nonprofit arts organizations have lost $9.1 billion as of um, July 13th, I believe, according to our data. 96% of orgs have canceled events since March, many well into next year, as you all know. Um, that's resulting in three point, or sorry, 327 million emissions loss. Um, 4.9 million uh, PPP loans have been given out. Of that, um, more than 170,000 were made to arts um, and creative um, economy businesses worth about $13.7 billion and preserved over 1.1 million jobs. So PPP um, has been a huge lifeline for a lot of folks. And again, um, there's still a lot of things around PPP that we would like um, them to do better in any further extension in terms of making access more um, available to um, nonprofits specifically. Um, another really big thing, as uh, somebody mentioned a little bit earlier, is the unemployment extension, um, that extra federal boost at $600 a week on top of whatever um, state legislatures are giving folks. Um, that's something that Democrats are really holding out on and um, there's, that's a big sticking point with uh, the administration and um, Senate Republicans right now. So we'll see where that ends up, but that's something that uh, Democrats are currently hoping to wait out, wait, wait out um, Republicans on the issue. Um, it's been a huge lifesaver in terms of <clears throat> 25 million for 25 million unemployed Americans. Um, the third thing we really want in this bill is another round of funding for the federal cultural agencies so they can um, th give that money to, to you guys uh, to distribute to folks that need it. Um, so those are really the three big issues that um, we are looking for in this round of funding. And to that end, we're working really closely with a lot of the other nonprofit national organizations. Um, so not just arts orgs, but American Heart Association, Love Association, a lot of those big nonprofits, United Way, um, because um, things in Washington really work around coalitions. And when it comes to nonprofits, having us all together in a coalition has been very huge in terms of getting some of these bills introduced that will hopefully end up being included um, in, um, in whatever final product passes, hopefully in the next few weeks, um, even things um, working with some for-profit groups, uh, things around the Restart Act and the Save Our Sages Act. So those are, aren't things that we, there are things in those bills that we obviously agree with. There are other things that wouldn't be our first priority, but with all of us sort of supporting these, it, it just gives uh, more weight to uh, members on Capitol Hill and staff to let them know that there's a huge group behind this. And we wanna fill in a lot of those gaps that PBP and some of these other programs that have already been enacted and we're hoping are extended don't necessarily touch. Um, so that's just a quick update. Um, again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to refer them to Julie or to us. Um, I'm sure you can share my info. I can put it in the chat. It's uh, P Gordon G O R D O N at artsusa.org. Um, and so, um, Julie, I don't know if Julie mentioned, I'm actually just coming back from attorney leave uh, as of yesterday. So, two months left. So, I'm sort of diving headfirst in and digging out from emails, but I'm happy to work with my team to answer questions as we can and be helpful in any way that we can. Peter, based on what you're seeing right now, do you think it's more realistic to expect the extension of PPP, some sort of um, additional $600 or whatever it may be, versus line items like SOS acts or things along the lines of um, more funding for the NEA um, at this point in time? Because we know that there was no funding for the NEA, for example, in, in the Senate bill. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's pretty clear that PPP will be extended. That's something that's incredibly bipartisan and everybody has seen um, while it hasn't worked perfectly, has worked well enough. And so that's something that is a big priority for both sides. Um, regarding um, NEA funding, I think that's something that should be in that bill. Um, and I know we want some emergency funding here, but also on the appropriation side, um, we were able to get um, additional money and at least the House bill for the appropriation side. So we're hoping for a plus up for their regular appropriations, but we are also hoping that there'll be something in there for the culture agencies. Um, 
regarding the SOS Act and um, some of those other bills, again, it's we're working with um, our coalitions to lean on our champions, not just arts champions, but nonprofit champions that have supported some of these other things, things around um, <clears throat> universal charitable deduction. So those are the members that have seen the devastating impact um, of COVID-19 on the nonprofit community. Um, and so as we can sort of couch it in the um, ways of <clears throat> frontline responders and things like that in working with these coalitions, there is more of a chance to get some of those things in there. So um, that, that's a little bit less likely than PPP because I think that's pretty much a given, but we are working as hard as we can to get as much as we can into this bill. And uh, Rick, when you had Katie Porter uh, on the call that I was on with you, um, one of the things that she said that you as advocates um, can be doing is letting your uh, representatives know if you did receive PPP, how that has helped you. Um, because we do wanna make the case for that second round, essentially the double dip, and particularly for the most vulnerable um, businesses, which of course we know is arts and culture. So, um, you know, there are templates um, Americans for the Arts, which we have through our website as well, that you can be sending out. So just wanted to bring that up. So Rick, did you want to introduce kind of what the next phase of our truly part of the conversation so we can all get your voices here? Yes, we, we really, uh, you know, just carved out about half our time to uh, brief you on all of this and, and introduce our arts champions in uh, Sacramento. But we are also here to listen to you and um, we did pull out a couple of major concerns, of course, uh, and that's relief funding and uh, also the AB5 issues, which I know are um, very high on people's lists. Uh, so uh, I don't want to necessarily discourage you from weighing in on those particular issues, but we are interested in hearing, uh, uh, in general, what are the concerns that you have? Um, and uh, what, are, what are your observations? What are the specific challenges of your own organization? And uh, maybe even how have you pivoted in ways that you think the rest of us might learn from? So uh, please use the raise hand function, you know, the button at the bottom or I'm on my iPhone, so I don't know where it is on the iPad or on your uh, desktop, but uh, here, uh, Jade is giving instructions how to raise your also, hand. Yeah, and you can also say in chat that you want to speak if that's easier. So now is the floor. So who's gonna who's gonna take it? Please, we're here to listen to you now. We really need to understand kind of what are some of the things that you're either facing or need us to be able to articulate to our um, you know both at the state and federal level. So what's been helpful? What's right. Uh, while you're all doing that, I have one uh, other th point I wanted to make earlier. So if you did receive any funding, either NEA or from your supervisor district, um, you know, any public funding you receive, you really should send thank you letters to your elected officials. And you should include uh, Senators uh, uh, Feinstein and Harris and your congressperson from your district because all the CARES Act funding came from, you know, federal government. But whether you got it through your district supervisor or not, the supervisor should get uh, a thank you. And you should CC the CEO of the county, Frank Kim, as well, because staff plays a, a very pivotal role in advising the Board of Supervisors on how to spend this money. And we want them to know that it's made a difference and that they are appreciated. This is how advocacy works. Also, uh, I wanted to also let you know that if you also wanted to just do a little bit more of a personal touch, you can also call their offices too. Um, believe it or not, they're more than happy to pick up the phone and talk to people right now. They are, um, I was really shocked. I was in Sacramento a few, uh, uh, several months ago, seems like forever. Um, but uh, they, I actually just knocked on people's doors and walked in and I talked to either, you know, top level staff people or the representative themselves. So it's, it's, they are actually, they want to hear from you. They really do.
And um, besides uh, any comments that you have, we're happy to answer any questions that may be on your mind about how things are working. You know, I guess one question I have, and this is maybe for Peter, if he's still with us, and that's on the PPP, I think um, something that, you know, so many of us are concerned with, the ones who actually got PPP loans is, um, do you think that the extension is just going to be for new loans, or will the extension that's approved allow all of us to come back to the trough again and, and apply for another round? That's a good question. Um, I, uh, I think we're, we're making a very big push to allow groups that have already gotten one loan to get a second loan. So right now, if you've got one loan, you can only get one loan. But I think that we've seen um, around sort of the rollout and how the forgiveness rules weren't super clear, hopefully now that they have time to think about that a little bit more. Um, and they've seen that a lot of these small businesses, a lot of you guys have gotten this money, but still need a lot more to continue to <clears throat> keep paying staff that um, that wasn't enough. Um, and so we are hoping that they will allow people to go back to the trough and double dip as you would say, but um, get that second bite of the apple. Um, so again, um, things are very much up in the air with all the discussions and the sides are pretty far apart, unfortunately, right now. Um, I think uh, Speaker Pelosi had a call yesterday with the Democratic caucus and mentioned that she would like a deal by the end of this week, but wasn't expecting something before next week. So again, time timeline wise, and unfortunately for a lot of small businesses, there's just a lot of uncertainty, but <clears throat> we're hopeful that they, over the next couple of days, they can sort of get a, a deem agreement in principle and staff can sort of spend day and night writing it up and can pass both chambers pretty quickly and have the president sign it. So um, to answer your question, hopefully that is the case, but <clears throat> we haven't had an indication one way or the other um, definitively yet. So one of the things that we work on in terms of um, both policy development and also just educating lawmakers is to look to the arts, um, not just for as we might say, arts for art's sake, which is really critical, but probably less available right now in terms of our ability to gather and to do what we normally do. But how can we provide those kind of engagement services that there might be contracts in other departments other than the California Arts Council, for example. And one of the things, and so that's our strategy along the arts integration versus just arts, um, you know, being in one separate area. And so one of the things that I want wanted to alert everyone to is that there is a new grants portal that the state has put together that you can access and you can find, I was speaking to um, Veterans Arts, right, um, organization that got a $2 million grant over three years in from the mental health state department, I mean, at department um, in, at the state level, not through the CAC. So one of the things I want to encourage arts organizations and artists to look beyond the sort of what you would normally look to in, in, in our quote unquote normal times, but in these times um, to look to um, contracts for, like I said, mental health, um, public health. How can we be in service to public health right now? We are excellent communicators. That's what the arts does. Um, and so we are proposing, for example, to the state that um, there's funds available to every county in California to then give back to artists and arts organizations to help change our behavior in terms of how we address the public health issue, wearing masks, social distancing, not gathering at the same level. So artists can be those types of communicators, but again, we're doing it, but we're not getting paid for it. So our big push is to make sure that artists and arts organizations are recognized in value in that way and being paid. So I'm curious if anybody on a call has thought to figure out ways, or if you're already doing it in, 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 in integrating yourself into other areas of, um, of the sort of public, you know, um, departments. Uh, I also had a, a couple of things that we I wanted to make sure we address is that um, the new PPP um, uh, rules allow for um, businesses to pay seasonal workers. That wasn't in the original um, package. So that uh, you can't, if you have seasonal workers, 
you can use PBP uh, money funds for the forgivable part of the loan. The other thing too that, and, and Julie and, and Rick will know this really well, is just that a lot of people in, in, in uh, government don't realize that nonprofits are businesses. They, they sometimes will say, oh, well, this is for business. It's not for nonprofits. Nonprofits are businesses. And we have to make sure that, that the legislators actually recognize that and understand that these are businesses. Just like the, the fact that they're nonprofit doesn't mean that they're not any more viable than any other business. That's right. And that's part of that $100 billion economic stimulus package that the legislator just put forward. Mentioned small businesses. We've been working with Cal nonprofits to make sure that it inserts nonprofits as well um, to recognize that exact point. All right, well, we're here to, he to hear from you. I can't believe that this Arts Orange County, this group of folks from Orange County has nothing to say right now. Um, somebody raise your hand. What's going on out there? Okay, I see one. Don Reese. Yay, Don. <laughs> Hi, Rick, thanks for bringing us all together. Um, you're doing a great job too, Rick. I just want to say that. Um, we've been uh, taking advantage of all the opportunities. We were a PPP loan recipient. Uh, we were also able to keep our um, part-time seasonal staff on board through our spring session. They were all independent artists. We also paid our artists out for our annual concert, which we had to cancel. So we're very proud of the fact that we're able to do that for our community and all of our individual artists. Um, Jason Holland, who's on the call right now, he also and I uh, speak each year at the Santa Ana Chamber on the impact and the economic development part of the arts in California, the nation, and the state. And I think for Orange County, and specifically California, I think if we lead with the economic development message of the arts, I know we hear the obviously impact of arts, like you talked about, Julie, arts for art's sake. I think when I think of um, uh, building healthy communities, um, the mental health challenges we have coming down, especially in uh, California with children um, because of COVID, um, disconnection within workforce and educational communities, how arts can make an impact in that. Um, nonprofits, is the third largest employer, just nonprofits in general, not arts, in the United States. Over 12 million uh, employer, employees come from the arts after manufacturing. And um, I think if we come out with some big numbers like that and we speak as one voice from the federal people that were on the call, um, I think that's really where it trickles down to the local organizations. I know Rick really speaks to that, the work he's been doing with the creative economy language and everything that we do there. But um, it has, really has to be a united voice. I know when we talk at Santa Ana Chamber, we were at the GROW conference this year, um, Jason and I, and Jason led the panel. People are just blown away. Like you said, Edmund, we are businesses. We, we employ millions of people. I think I said in my report at the GROW conference, I think in California, it's a $466 billion creative economy in California. That's individual artists, uh, the, you know, we think digital fashion technology, like we have to get on board with that. And today I think we're so much better than we were in the great recession. Cause I think we learned a lot from the great recession when we weren't at the table of these kinds of conversations. So um, at the wooden floor, we break the cycle of poverty through the power of dance and access to education. So we know that, um, you know, we're, that's how we're making a difference in our world. So thank you. Don, that's such excellent points. And I think that that's absolutely right. I think we have, you know, obviously as a, we've led with the creative economy and, and successfully for many, many years, but the creative economy includes a lot of different types of businesses and artists and cultural workers and creative practitioners. And we tend to silo in the arts too. So I think one of the things I know Peter um, mentioned it, you know, and we're seeing it both at the federal and state level, and I'm sure you're seeing this locally too. And one of the opportunities right now is that we're actually coming together and talking to each other and seeing ourselves as an industry 
Um, and I think that when we are united and we come with that, no, those numbers are not just based on nonprofits. They're based on everything from Disney, Edmund works with, down to the individual artist. And so we, need, we do need to be as inclusive as possible in our messaging and build that coalition. But I also think what's really important in your messaging is you break the cycle of poverty through dance. That's a really critical message for law lawmakers to hear as well. And for them to understand that that is actually a cost saving in yeah. the long run as well. So, you know, that's where that second responders comes in because you are doing, you're rebuilding lives. You're not going into a building and saving the life, but you're rebuilding a life. And that is really critical. And that's where we also want to educate, not just the economic, but the also the, the social impact because it does have an economic benefit, but it also has an incredible benefit to, um, to our communities in a, in a much more holistic way as well. So well, thank and, you. Our, and our children are uh, low income, extremely low income in poverty in Orange County. So, you know, for ourselves, we do see it also in some cases, we are saving lives from gang violence and other places in our community from drugs and other um, behaviors that the children can get into. And, and for us, it's like, if we don't focus on our youth, that's my focus area is that um, we have a, a slippery slope of our society that's gonna go down pretty quick. And I'm, I'm doing a lot of research right now on the long-term impact of COVID. And COVID is, even though it's gonna be a short-term aspect in our lives as adults, you know, a two year, hopefully <laughs> we'll get past it. And it, the two year in, a, in, the, in the child scope could have almost a, a 10 to 20 year impact in long-term earnings and GDP impact to our whole nation. And so it's really, it's really going to be because of distance learning and all the other challenges that are coming down the pike because of it. So I think we have a lot, which I think the arts can make such a dramatic difference in. Absolutely. I really think that's the opportunity right now is to center that and to, and to uplift it and bring it forward to lawmakers for them to truly understand this is a pivotal moment for our sector. We have made big strides in terms of showing the economic benefit, but now we, we're in a public health crisis. That's the number one thing that we're dealing with. So really it is also to say, how are you impacting and being a part of that solution? And I think you can really clearly make that statement. Um, and so it's not a wait till we're in recovery that we need to be addressed. We are part of it now. And, um, but we don't, have, we don't have the ability as much to earn the revenue. And that's why we need that relief and those subsidies and those contracts that government can also supply that can be in benefit to public health and mental health and wellness. The idea of organizing during this time of a pandemic is, uh, it's, it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive because we're trying to organize you know, the, uh, ourselves as a single voice right now for the workers who aren't working. But don't let a good pandemic go to waste. This is our time to actually find our voice together so we can actually move legislators in, in not only in their, their hearts, but also their minds and their pocketbooks so that we can actually find a way forward so that in case something like this happens again, we are in a much better position to be able to survive survive uh, a, catas a catastrophe like this. Uh, that's a, a great point, Edmund. And I have to tell you that um, as, as we all know, this has also been a time of raised awareness uh, through Black Lives Matter of racial injustice. And uh, it's a time when many of our organizations and, and many artists in the community are speaking up vociferously about these issues of racial equity and cultural equity. And um, our own organization is taking that seriously and has a task force. Many other organizations are doing so. And, our, and uh, you, know, you would think that maybe this isn't the right time to have that conversation when we're all so obsessed with the survival of our organizations as well. Uh, but I disagree. I, I think, yes, why let a good pandemic go to waste? Um, it's, it's a time when uh, we are rethinking everything about what we do and why we do it. So why not this too? And so um, we will be uh, in the not too distant future, Arts Orange County will be sponsoring some uh, speakers 
on this topic to uh, further the conversation and perhaps provide some resources that will enable all of us to do better in that regard, because we all have to. Thanks. That, that's so critically important, Rick, in, in terms of how arts can also center that message. And, and it is artists who are, um, who are putting that um, together in a way that moves all of us and, and is part of what we can change in terms of um, you know, cultural equity and racial equity within our communities and through arts and through those community connections that the cultural organizations and artists make. Um, I think one of the key pieces too, everybody has a story like Dawn, um, I'm sure on this call and, you know, telling those stories to your lawmakers and you've gotten an incredible champion and, and leadership in Rick. And that's, a, I can tell you, I'm doing nine of these across the region. Not every region has somebody like Rick. So number one, I'm sure you're all members of his organization, but you should be because he does, does an amazing job to really represent you. But, you know, I think that telling those stories to your lawmakers, as Jason mentioned, now is that opportunity you saw their home like everybody else. They're not even in Sacramento, a lot of them, because um, you know they don't have to be right now. And so I think that this is a time to, to center your story around the impact that you're making on those communities, the communities of color, the people who are disenfranchised, who are not invested in, um, and telling those stories and how what a difference that makes not only on the economy which is important but also on that social impact and 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 I, I tell you they it really does it does help change lawmakers minds right Rick I mean and Rick's been doing this work much longer than I have and it, it really makes a difference when we tell those stories in, in that way so I encourage you to do that um, right now with your lawmakers. in fact I'd go beyond that I'd say they are naturally receptive to it but they weren't hearing from us. And once we started knocking on their doors and sharing these stories, they, they couldn't have been more eager to help us. Because, you know, as, as Jason, our lobbyist, uh, often told me when we first hired him for CAA several years ago, it was, you know, they ran when they saw him coming because he often was representing interests that were controversial or that they didn't want to deal with. But when once he started representing the arts, it was like they couldn't wait to see him to talk about that. Am I right, Jason, if you're still on? <laughs> <laughs> he's not on, he had to run, but he's, oh. yes, I would tell you that that is absolutely the truth of what I experienced with him as well. And um, it is a bipartisan issue for the most part. We see it both at the federal and, and state level, but um, I think what we're all, seeing right now is an opportunity. And, and so I know that maybe not adding one more thing to your job, which is to be an arts advocate at the same time, but if, if you can send out those letters and make contacts with your electeds and, and Rick can certainly help you um, with that within your local community. Patrick, did you wanna to add to the conversation? Unmute, there we go. <laughs> Hi, uh, Julie, Rick, uh, I've, I'm, I'm grateful and, and, and excited to be listening to you right now. Uh, uh, I Run the Silence is Broken, which uses the creative and performing arts and new media as tools to rally communities and inspire investment in them. And like Dawn, uh, when, when we started The Silence is Broken, it was all about um, creating awareness for uh, black women who were dealing with HIV and AIDS and the effect that their families, uh, the effect that it had on their families and them personally. And uh, to the exclusion of no other group, um, I've always believed that uh, uh, the creative and performing arts and the visceral impact of the creative and performing arts is you, you, ca you can't, uh, uh, you can't put a, uh, you can't measure it. You can only see it. You can't put an actual number on it. So one of the things that, that I've enjoyed about this call and one of the things that I'm still baffled about uh, is, is, is the fact that we make docu-concerts, right? And we sell those docu-concerts uh, to allow us to do other docu-concerts. And we're always trying to make friends and we've taken our pieces and we've made uh, telephone calls and we've done screenings and we've raised money for different people all over the country. 
And one of the things, one of the great things that I, that I love about The Silence is Broken, it, which is, uh, uh, is the fact that we are, uh, it lives online. The Silence is Broken lives online. We create our docu concerts with audiences. That is not gonna happen for a long time. But the fact that we made these docu concerts where we're talking about HIV and AIDS, where we package other pieces, where we talk about the horror to uh, beauty that is jazz music, uh, uh, it resonates with, with audiences. Uh, but our dilemma at this point, uh, the dilemma that I see is connecting. Uh, I always lived in Los Angeles, but connecting to people like yourself and Rick in Orange County to talk about uh, the silence is broke, to talk about HIV and AIDS, to talk about jazz as as this you know uh, you know slavery to our present uh, moment, and uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, until today how to actually go about that, and that's why I raised my hand. I just want to share the fact that we exist and share the fact that we are, a lot of nonprofits, we, we dependent upon government, we're dependent on our grantsmanship and we haven't received grantsmanship. Everything that we do is because we made sales and, and that's empowering. And we can see how empowering it is and we can count and we can quantify that based upon the COVID 19 pandemic it's useful now and uh as we share the silence is broken we've been able to give we go into our screenings or somebody becomes an affiliate with the silence is broken and we've given away money because those people have shared it with their supporters those people have shared it with their with their constituents and you know maybe it was a hundred people but they still made ten thousand or a thousand dollars for sharing our video and it's necessary for us because it allows us to stay afloat and alive and available to uh to go to other musicians to go up to other artists and say what would you like to create and like you were just uh don was talking about and what you talked about how we can be of service to other people in community to other sectors of community, mental health black lives matter uh, uh, whatever the issue is that heretofore has been unsolvable, our goal is to solve it. Our goal is to bring resource to it, to, to allow that intractable issue to fade into the sunset and to help people. And like I said, uh, I, I, I feel a little vulnerable here because I, I'm, I, I didn't know how to do that here uh, amongst peers in Orange County until this very moment. And that's why I'm sharing. So thank well, you. Well, Patrick, I'm so glad you did. And, um, uh, you know, we want to get to know more about you and your organization. There, one of the things that we've discovered as a result of the crisis is so many other art, artists and arts organizations that were not on our radar screen until now. Uh, because, you know, Orange County is, is a big and growing community and um, we're fairly limited in our resources and we do try to reach out and discover, we're always discovering new initiatives and organizations in the community. But as a result of some of these funding opportunities, uh, applications have come in from organizations that we absolutely never heard of. Heard of. And in fact, uh, that's how we heard about the silence is broken because you applied for one of them. We saw your application. So I'm really glad you're on the call. And I know there probably are other people on the call too who are new to the community or just have even been around for a while and we, they've been beneath our radar. And so we want to know about all of you because we're here to advocate and speak up on your behalf. So thanks again for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's exciting, you know, purpose for these calls. And so thank you for validating the purpose. 
<laughs> of why we wanted to do these. It really also helps, like I said, to be your advocates at the state and federal level and Rick and Edmund also being on our board and, and voicing specifically from this region. It, we can be better if we're informed. And so um, hearing from you is really critical. Also, um, you can share your stories. We actually have, um, and I think Jada has already shared the link, but we'll send it to you guys again. There's actually a spot on our website where you can upload stories about who you are and what you do, and, we'll, and we will be happy to amplify that. And we can also look to that as how we also create our own narrative in ways that we can communicate to lawmakers and, and the impact of the arts sector. And it is really important that we're hearing from it in all the districts, because when lawmakers see that every district has impactful arts and culture programs, that's when they're more likely to say, well, we can't cut that because it's making such a huge difference. If, and so, so having, raising the voices from, you know, every place across California, which is really different. I mean, our, our, our state goes from extremely rural to the most, you know, uh, biggest urban communities. And uh, we, need to, we need to be able to, to show that and where the arts and culture fit into every aspect of that. So thank you for that. Thank you for speaking up. I really appreciate hearing from you. And I'm going to look up your program as soon as we're done here. So um, I, it's 11-11, um, Rick. So I don't want to take, we had said, we said 60 to 75. I think we promised 60, but we know these yeah. go over. Yeah. Um, I don't, but I also don't want to cut anyone short. If there's anyone who wants to add in anything at this moment, please do. I, I don't have to rush quite yet, but if not, Maybe Rick, you want to make some points? Just a, a little wrap up. Thank you so much, Julie, for organizing these around, around the state and for all that you do. Julie is our first executive director and she's been on the job for about two years now. And um, uh, she's uh, a, a dynamo and um, has really raised the profile of California's the arts immensely. It had been all volunteer run for its first 25 years. So, uh, it's great having her and it, it makes it possible for us, the volunteer board members, to be able to do more of what we need to be doing and that's connecting our communities to the rest of the state in, and nation in being effective advocates. Uh, and again, not just for funding, but for policy issues like we've talked about with AB5 and there are other issues that come up on a policy basis that we have to deal with from time to time. Uh, that impact our sector and um, also to you know just raise that awareness and make sure that you know uh, not just the public officials but also the the private sector uh, is aware of what we're doing and how important we are uh, because um, you know they have a lot of resource they're also voters and th uh, that's important for us to connect with they're important for us to connect with as well so uh, thanks for coming to Orange County today, <laughs> virtually. And thanks to everybody who attended. We had, I think, over 50 people I saw. I counted on our list of attendees. And uh, we'll keep the conversation going. That is for sure. Yes, thank you so much. We hope this isn't the last conversation with Arts Orange, with all of you in Orange County. And stay safe and stay well. And uh, let's all make, move the needle together. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.